Hello everyone and welcome. We might start in the interest of time. Thank you for joining us on this webinar titled BetaShares SMA Model Portfolios. Uh, before we start, I just need to highlight, firstly, this is a webinar for financial advisors only and it's not for dis re retail distribution. Secondly, all information in this presentation is general in nature and does not take into account individual personal circumstances of your clients. Uh, a recording of this webinar and the accompanying slides will be available in due course. Uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go along. There's a toggle button uh, there on the side and certainly we'll endeavour to answer all questions either at the end or as a follow-up. Okay, now with the formalities out of the way, uh, let me please introduce myself. My name is Vinnie Wadera. I'm an Executive Director uh, responsible for institutional and advisor services and, and the teams at BetaShares. I've been with BetaShares for 10 years now and previously I've been a, a research manager at a large wealth management group um, responsible for, for model management and manager search and selection. I'm also joined today by my colleague and friend uh, David Bassanese, our Chief Economist. Hi, Dave. Hi, Benny. Good to be with you today. Good to be with everyone. Great. Many of you do know Dave. He's been with BetaShares for seven years now and previously he was the economics editor at the Financial Review and, and an economist at the OECD in Paris and Macquarie Bank. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. We've got a record number of advisors that have joined us today. Um, I, I know some of you either as your account manager or I've joined you with one of my account management colleagues during a meeting with you and certainly hope to catch up with you as a follow-up to this um, and either way your BetaShares account manager will follow up. And a very warm welcome to all of the advisors that are new to BetaShares. So today we're going to cover four things in the time we have. Um, I'm going to give you a quick update on BetaShares. We're going to um, share a little bit about managed accounts and model portfolios, the, the merging of technology with portfolio management. We'll cover a high level overview of the BetaShares SMA model portfolios and then we'll talk about and share advisor service and support that we have in this area. Um, just a quick update for those that are new to BetaShares. Uh, BetaShares is an Australian founded investment manager that specialises in exchange traded funds, ETFs. Our business was founded 11 years ago. Uh, we have had tremendous growth in our business. We presently have over 20 billion in terms of assets under management. We now have the largest number of ETFs compared to any other fund manager in this space and the widest range too that spans across asset classes, different thematics, different sectors and diversified funds. Uh, many of you that have dialed in today um, have over the years taken the time and effort to review and select BetaShares ETFs for your client portfolios and we sincerely thank you for those, for, for your efforts in that regard. Um, we, uh, look, we believe we've received this very strong level of support from a very wide range of investors. Firstly, due to the fact that we have a unique and differentiated uh, strategy suite, we're able to demonstrate the value of each of our ETFs uh, and that value can either be a low cost uh, or it can be delivered in, in many other different ways. And secondly is the, the service and support, particularly to advisor advisors. Um, we have a dedicated account management team, education, materials, reporting, analytics service. And importantly why I wanted to highlight that is that the same rigour that we've applied to service and support uh, for advisors for our ETFs, we, we now have applied to the BetaShares SMA model portfolios. Uh, these, these model portfolios are on equal footing as our ETFs in terms of business priority and hence all of the service and, and support. Okay, let's now turn to managed accounts. Look, there's, there's a lot, we could do a whole webinar on, on the benefits of managed accounts. Um, certainly, if anyone is exploring managed accounts, we're certainly very happy to have a follow-up discussion, particularly as it relates to model portfolios and we can do that with the, the respective representative from your, the platform that you use. Um, but look, investment trends, and we, and we are involved with investment trends. Investment trends are a research uh, service firm for financial services and they do a great survey. We've got some findings that may be of use to you here that we'll share where they survey, where they survey 
a number of financial advisors. I think last year the survey was 658 advisors and um, tabulating their preferences. So no surprise, we see that um, going forward over the next three years, uh, almost 50%, so 49% of advisors will be applying managed accounts to new inflows and new clients. I look at separate to surveys, the Institute of Managed Account Providers, IMAP, actually published their annual census just yesterday. And that, that had 111 billion uh, that is currently now in managed accounts. And interestingly, that number has increased by 80 billion. So 80 billion of that 111 billion has actually been delivered in the last five years. And, and looking through the data there, just in the last 12 months, the SMA category of the managed accounts has actually increased 82% from 23 billion to 51 billion. So certainly the adoption by advisors of managed accounts and specifically SMAs, it has dramatically increased in the last few years. Um, a lot of it goes to what investment trends uh, and their findings is why do advisors use them? And it's interesting, you probably group this into two categories here. Uh, from this survey. One is the, in terms of freeing up time, all that administrative compliance burden. And as it relates to uh, model portfolios, in terms of freeing up time for doing portfolio management, all the research that's involved around that. And then the other area is around the implementation and admin. And the big one there, of course, is um, ROAs, doing away with records of advice every time a change is made to a portfolio for a particular client. The other interesting reason for usage that's very high there is transparency. So clients see the underlying portfolio. And of course, if the underlying portfolio is holding ETFs, there's that next level of transparency in terms of the ETFs holdings itself. So that's the why in terms of advisors using. In terms of what are advisors looking for, in terms of a model manager and investment trends did ask that question to the survey of advisors last year. A look at the top of the list is good performance. Um, good performance followed by commentary, so that's that whole reporting and support function, and then diversification. And interestingly, uh, model model portfolios in an SMA have really been adopted over the last few years. Interestingly, a survey out of the US, which has been the advisors there are using model portfolios for, for much longer. Um, interesting survey there is uh, 1,500 model, model portfolios are in the US. Model managers were asked the question in this survey, what are advisors seeking from your model portfolio? And interestingly, right at the top there was fees. Open architecture followed, so the availability of those models on various platforms. So there's just an interesting uh, snippet there from the US. And look, another important aspect here, and again, it was captured in the investment trends survey, is uh, meeting the obligations to clients in terms of best interest duty. So again, advisors did share with investment trends how they go about doing this. And certainly from the questions we receive from advisors, um, it's, it's a similar, similar uh, rationale also. Right at the top of the list in terms of meeting best interest duty for SMAs is comparing fees, followed by assessing the expertise of the portfolio manager and then utilising third party research. And again, beta shares for our own model portfolio service, uh, we can assist in this process too, in terms of the analytics, in terms of comparisons, and in terms of third party research. So that covers the, the managed accounts piece. In terms of ETF model portfolios, there, there are actually a number of applications for these. And I've listed them out here and I'll run through them very briefly. Firstly is, and it ties in with the whole managed account space in terms of freeing up time, administration efficiencies, is the outsourcing uh, application. Uh, and, and this is really asking the question, as an advisor, do you want to take on the role as portfolio manager also? And if so, the, 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 the accountability that comes with that, and how do you get compensated for that too in terms of fees? Many advisors have decided not to take on that responsibility and they outsource that to a professional model manager. 
and they then that allows them to focus on other aspects of advice, other other value add areas where they can be uh, remunerated for. Another application for ETF model portfolios is where advisors will segment their client base. So up to a certain dollar value of a portfolio can go into a, an ETF model portfolio or with a professional model manager and then the advisor still retains bespoke portfolio construction for, for larger portfolio sizes. Another application is an alternative to industry super funds. Um, pricing levels now, particularly when you include the administration costs, uh, can be actually on par with industry super funds uh, and very competitive. Um, the additional value uh, or, the, or, the, or the value that the client has in terms of uh, an ETF model portfolio on super is a couple of things. Firstly is the simplicity. It's, it, 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 has, it only includes the major asset classes and it doesn't include a lot of the other sort of more complex type of investments that, that big super funds can have, particularly in the unlisted and private space, which, which generally may not be marked to market. And also the transparency. So the transparency of holdings and then with an ETF portfolio, the holdings of those ETFs. And I could also add the engagement piece too in terms of the reporting and the accessibility of the model manager through the advisor to the clients too. And then the fourth one, which is very interesting and we're seeing um, the most adoption of, of ETF model portfolios is a core satellite approach. So this is where, and I might go to the next page here, this is where a, a core, the core part of the portfolio, say 75%, 80% or, or whatever percentage that you have in the core part is taken care of with a low cost model portfolio. And then you as the advisor can actually implement client preferences around that as satellite allocations, whether that be active managers, thematics, alternatives, or specific regions and countries. But importantly, that core part of the portfolio needs to deliver on the original asset class assumptions and expected returns and risk tolerances that were modelled as part of the optimization process. And it also needs to be that part of the portfolio that may need to be held for a long period of time, depending on the investor profile, 5, 10, 20 years. It also needs to be the part of the portfolio that's low cost, low turnover, low transaction costs, and that can weather, weather different market cycles uh, in terms of varying and various market conditions. So it's a very important part of the portfolio to, to get right. And of course, have long-term value net of fees. So on that, on that note, uh, I'll segue to the BetaShares SMA model portfolios. And Dave, I'm going to let you now cover, please, if you could share with our advisor audience here a little bit about our approach, our investment philosophy, uh, who's involved, and then a high-level overview of both our strategic asset allocation for formulation and how we go about doing dynamic asset allocation. Yeah, thanks, Benny. And uh, and uh, look, as we'll see on the, the first slide there, the investment philosophy, there's really a, a few features of it. Um, first and foremost, um, it's, it, we, we basically give the models uh, have access to a range of asset classes and it's passive expo exposure to asset classes, uh, be it cash, Australian bonds, global bonds, uh, Australian and global equities, uh, and an opportunity to have gold as well. Gold is, is in the mix. Uh, we don't necessarily always invest in gold, but we do have that capacity in there as well. So, so again, it's not active in the sense of trying to you know, pick stocks within asset classes or pick bonds, you know, beat various indexes. Uh, we do look at that when we talk about dy dynamic asset allocation at the next point, but, um, uh, but, 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 but in terms of the overall, uh, what, what's going on within asset classes, it is really that passive low cost exposure to those assets. Um, and we do that through ETFs. And so again, all the, all the um, underlying investments in the models are, uh, index tracking exchange traded funds. That's the um, the uh, you know the requirement we've imposed on the models. Uh, that it helps transparency. It also helps keep them uh, quite low cost. Uh, the bedrock of this is also a strategic. Again, we we basically as we'll get into it, the bedrock of this is a strategic asset allocation. So we 
we, we basically blend exposure to different asset classes to, to try to come up with the best uh, expected long run return for different different risk profiles. And then we express that that um, asset exposure um, by, through the choice of ETFs. Now, some of those ETFs, that, although they are index tracking, they're also smart beta. So again, like a smart, what is smart beta? Smart beta is, um, it's an, it tracks an index, but it doesn't just track, say, a market cap index. And then, um, you know, there are some uh, strategies uh, we, uh, we feel, uh, and certainly the history demonstrates, can beat market cap indices over time. Uh, and uh, where, where we see that opportunity, we, we've added some of those uh, into the models as we can talk about in a minute. Look, a very important, also a very distinguishing point of our philosophy is the best of breed ETF selection. So when you go to the models, you'll see it's not just beta shares ETFs. Uh, and uh, in some cases, you know, where uh, we want just really, you know, plain vanilla, low cost exposure to an asset class. and um, and there's other providers that offer that um, uh, in a way that you know we don't, and they offer it at a better value. Um, then we we were certainly open to using other providers. Uh, and last but not least, as I mentioned, the bedrock of these are strategic asset allocations, uh, but we do have a dynamic asset allocation over, overlay where we we aim to tilt moderately uh, against different asset classes over time, which I'll touch in at, at a moment. We think that improves risk-adjusted return. Now, who does all this? So here's our beta shares investment committee, um, uh, chaired by myself, uh, but also an extensive uh, team uh, from our portfolio management. In terms of voting members, uh, we have a very extensive team with a lot of experience. Uh, our chief investment officer, Louis Krauss, our, our CEO, nonetheless, Alex Minicor, is also a member of the committee. Um, and again, many, many years of experience in financial markets. Uh, Louis as well as a, a as a, um, a financial operator and uh, trader and portfolio manager. Uh, and we have Tong, uh, Chamath as well, and they are all part of the um, portfolio management team. And again, many, many years uh, at the coalface, um, managing portfolios, uh, trading in financial markets. Um, and then we have a, a couple of other non-voting members that, that just provide some color in terms of, you know, what's happening on in the broader markets, uh, and in the in, in the basically you know um, industry generally, but uh, they, they're not voting members. Um, moving right along, so to, to, look, bottom line, strategic asset allocation. This this process is not too different from what you'd find most um, you know portfolio managers when they build a strategic asset allocation. You know, approach it in a, in a similar way. This is industry standard approach. Uh, so we look at the asset classes. Uh, uh, the, and again, we have seven broad asset classes. We, we, we develop long run expected returns from those asset classes. Uh, then we look at, uh, consider what's the volatility and uh, correlation of the returns between those asset classes. And those inputs go into an optimization process uh, where we um, you know, try to you know, give you exposure to the different classes, but in a way that can generate a pretty good return, but, but calibrated so that you know, the risk of each model uh, is in line with certain risk measures. Um, and if we just go to, and, and so basically, sorry, if we just go back to the previous slide, just to conclude on that. So we put that, and we do review this on an annual basis. So all of these inputs, the asset classes, the expected returns, uh, the correlations, and you know, we, we, we learn a little, every, every year we, we learn a little bit more about asset class behavior. So incrementally, it may uh, change things at the margin, but generally speaking, these you know these are long run asset allocations that won't change greatly from a year to year basis. But but nonetheless, all of this is reviewed by the investment committee, uh, and the SEA weights uh, are then finalised uh, at the at the on, again on an annual basis. And so, what does that look like? If we just go to the next slide, uh, oh sorry, before I talk about that, again, this is another important aspect of our models is that. When we optimise these models, we do we are very conscious of the APRA standard risk measures. So in a way, the constraint on our models, for example, take a balanced portfolio. It's to try to give you the best uh, long run expected return across those asset classes, subject to no more than three negative return years uh, over a 20 year period. Is that that expectation? And so that's effectively the constraint on the optimization process. Um, and you'll see, and, and again, it, it applies for all the different risk profiles there. Conservative, no more than one negative return year. 
uh, high growth uh, up to up to six negative return years possible. So importantly, importantly, all these all these models uh, are designed to be consistent with the APRA risk measures and give you a reasonable basis for you know choosing a certain model uh, in terms of risk profile for for different clients. Obviously, you make that decision as the as the um, as the advisor as to what is the appropriate risk uh, classification for a client. But then you know we we aim to offer models that certainly uh, we think meet the uh, the reasonable basis justification for 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 the different um you know different uh, uh, mod, uh different profiles um moving right along so this is what it would look like at the moment so for example as you can see that we start with the asset classes so before we consider the etfs we get you know we get we choose the asset classes and we get the 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 mix of asset class exposures uh to the you know what we think is 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 the best and as you can see, take the balance portfolio, for example, it's a 50-50 allocation between growth and defensive, uh, split between cash, international bonds. Uh, look, gold is in there. The strategic weight to gold there is zero. But as I said, over time, we have on and off uh, allocated to, to gold at different, and gold has a, a good role as a, as a diversifying asset. Um, it has low correlation with equities and bonds generally. Um, and that's uh, and that that feature is a handy thing to rely on at certain times. And as you can see, we split between global and Australian equities, and we also have importantly an allocation to listed property. Uh, and again, you know, some models do, some models don't, but it is generally regarded as a as a distinct asset class uh, in Australia, and we thought it appropriate that it should be represented as a as a separate asset class in the models. Uh, but, but again, if, based on our long run expected returns for those asset classes, at the moment, a balanced portfolio, uh, we would anticipate generating something like a 5.5% annualised return uh, with a standard deviation of 6%. Uh, the bottom line of that is that, you know, on average, there's a 15% probability of a negative return of that portfolio in any given year. So you times that by 20, you get three uh, negative return years on average every 20 years. So that's the way that optimization process works. And you can see there's more, uh, you know, we tolerate a bit more standard deviation as you go up the risk profile and, and, and less as you go down the risk profile. Then we get on to dynamic. So within that, so th uh, with, uh, once that is all, 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 all laid down, then we can consider, and again, we do consider this on a quarterly basis, a dynamic asset allocation over, overlay. And um, again, our investment committee does meet quarterly. Uh, and so we look at things, as you can see there, we look at, uh, uh, there's a few um, elements that go into that process. Firstly, what we call the fundamental asset class driver matrix. And so basically looking at things like trends in corporate earnings, uh, trends in interest rates, um, and, and those in turn, uh, you know, help you form a judgment as to, for example, if bond yields are going up, you would typically want to be, um, you know, cautious with regard to exposure to fixed income bonds versus cash and cautious with regard to things like listed property. Um, if earnings are rising, you know, that's a positive environment for equity. So we just keep a, a track on those broad trends. Uh, we do also, that, that we do have some quantitative aspects to it as well. So. Uh, what we call an historic valuations matrix. So our portfolio management team uh, does uh, every uh, every meeting present uh, where, where valuations are for different asset classes and what historically that has tended to generate uh, in terms of returns uh, for different asset classes. And so generally speaking, you know that that is of value, particularly when you get some extreme valuations, um, and that may flavour that our you know decisions as to whether to tilt one asset class over another. Uh, the other one is the last element is a rolling one year projected asset class uh, modeling. And, and essentially that is like a base case scenario. So, um, and that's something I de 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 develop uh, and present to the co investment committee um, uh, where it's basically a four, one year ahead forecast of interest rates, uh, earnings growth, where we may see the equity risk premium um, uh, for different uh, for, for Australia property global equities, and that in turn uh, generates expected returns uh, for the different asset classes. And uh, again, that uh, goes into the mix. We, again, importantly, this is not a pure quantitative process. Uh, quantitative inputs are very important, um, but ultimately uh, we, we, there is an element of, uh, of uh, qualitative judgment as well uh, that goes into the decision making. And that's important because 
valuations and and what uh, mar markets change uh, over over the years and we we you know the hist we think if you rigorously apply historic valuation frameworks for example you can get it wrong because those valuations have changed over time equity risk premiums have changed bond yields have changed uh, and simply re assuming you know a regression to some historic mean um, uh, you can uh, is, is probably not the best way definitely keep in mind keep those in mind but don't slavishly um, uh, base your decisions on those and you'll, you'll see a flavor of the qualitative uh, considerations when we get into the um, rest of the presentation that's it from me Vinny for the moment no great Dave thank you and we have a lot more information and documentation on our investment process the uh, both the ETF selection the risk management framework and the asset class formulation and the dynamic asset allocation so please reach out to us and we're very happy to have a follow-up meeting with you to run through that process Dave um, and I'm conscious of time here it would be useful just to share what our current asset class views are and how does that translate to the dynamic asset allocation tilts? Yeah, no worries. Now, so again, when we think about DAA, we actually break it down into a handful of key decisions. And the first one is growth versus defensive. Should you be overweight equities uh, versus defensive uh, cash and bonds, for example? Uh, the other key decision is being overweight or underweight Australian versus um, international equities. And again, we don't go too micro in that. We don't, you know, choose Europe versus Japan or or the US. It's that really highly aggregated uh, decision. And the other consideration is bonds versus cash and where the interest rates are, where we are in the cycle. But this this first chart just highlights that you know one way to think about growth versus defensive, and it really. You know, again, we do look at the quantitative aspects, but one of the qualitative aspects is have a judgment as where we think we are in the cycle. And this just shows you the, the returns of equities versus bonds over time uh, is the orange line uh, versus the US unemployment rate. And the gray areas are, are recessions. And what it shows you is that the periods of most damage in terms of equity returns uh, happen during US recessions. So we are laser focused on the risks of US recession. And when they are, we think, a, a, a material, um, that's when we would uh, uh, potentially go underweight uh, equities. Uh, when we're in a, an expansion phase, and one of the you know, key indicators of that is just how tight the US labor market is. And that, that's why we've got the unemployment rate there. But at the moment, we think we, we've come out of a recession. It was a very short, sharp recession due to COVID last year. Uh, we are in a new expansion phase. Uh, the US unemployment rate is not quite back to full employment. Uh, and uh, we think there's a, you know, there, so we think we're early to mid stage of a new cycle, which historically tends to favour equities over bonds. Uh, and, that, and so as a result, um, that's a, you know, a key underpinning of our current overweight to equities um, uh, versus bonds. Now they may get full, but, uh, just, and just in terms of, uh, uh, and one of one of the considerations also at the moment is, um, you know, will will we had we have seen higher inflation in the U.S. Uh, and there's some concerns that that may lead to you know an increase in interest rates. The Federal Reserve may bring forward tightening. Uh, we we our judgment uh, is that it's uh, a lot of the inflation we're seeing in the U.S. is largely transitory. Um, if you look at things like the weighted the, the the trim mean PCE, which looks at a broader distribution of price increases in the U.S. You can see that has not gone up anywhere near as much as the um, the uh, the core CPI, uh, and that's because the core CPI has been driven by a handful of items like used car prices, uh, hotel rates that have basically gone up uh, in reaction to the COVID shutdowns. So again, our judgment is that that the interest rates are going to basically remain fairly steady for the foreseeable future. We don't think Fed tapering. Uh, which will be announced in the next few months is going to change that all that much. So at the moment, we are still then as a result uh, exposed to fixed income bonds. We're not underweight bonds. Uh, and that's giving us a nice yield pickup over cash um, at the moment. And uh, when we get closer to Fed tightening uh, or even, you know, RBA tightening, we still think that's a year or so away. That would be, you know, when we would consider potentially going underweight uh, bonds. Last but not least, just a, a quick, uh, just going to the next slide there. Um, oh, Dave, I've just, oh, yeah, there you go, sorry. 
And just quick, quickly, I mean, it, it, we've tended to uh, global versus Australian equities, and one of the key decisions there is what fact, what sectors do you think are driving the expansion? Uh, and in an environment where technology and growth tends to do better, uh, it, it tends to be uh, outperforming um, versus, say, commodities. Uh, global markets tend to outperform Australia, and we we think in the main that that is remaining the um, the, the main uh, driver of global markets. We see technology uh, growth globally continuing to outperform uh, commodity exposures, uh, which in turn at the moment favour being overweight global markets versus the uh, the, the Australian market. And again, we don't, uh, and so that 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 chart just shows you that over the last 30 years there's been you know two cycles, two commodity one commodity boom. Um, at, and before and after that, we've had a tech boom, and currently we're in a, um, you know, an environment where technology is still broadly outperforming commodities. Um, and so, just to conclude, just on that slide, that, that and then this is a this is a, a part of our quarterly model portfolio report that comes out, and it really just summarises our DAA views. And as you can see at the moment, we're overweight growth versus defensive. The underweight to defensive is in floating rate bonds, not fixed rate bonds. So again, our judgment is that the yield pickup we're getting from bonds uh, is is um, uh, is is uh, sufficient for the for the risk that you're taking from from bonds. And then within equities, our, our key view there is still to be a little bit underweight Australia versus growth uh, versus global markets. Back to you, Vinny. Great, great, Dave. Thank you so much for that. I might just now, uh, Sharon, I, I think I've lost access to drive the slide. So if you can do that, that, that'll be great. Um, I'll just highlight just some key features of the BetaShares SMA models. Firstly is low cost. Now look, this is an indicative uh, pricing. Oh, actually what, what's not indicative is the underlying fund fees and the portfolio management fees. So 19, 19 basis points a piece. And, and that is exactly what's in the PDSs of the platforms. Uh, what is indicative is the platform administration fee that is in addition to uh, the model management and the underlying uh, ETF fees. Uh, that generally you'll have to negotiate with the platforms and, and that can be lower depending on scale. But I put an indicative, an, an average amount of 31 basis points. So what you can see is an all-in fee load to the client, including administration and before the advisor service fee of it comes in at around 70 basis points or, or potentially less. Now the key point is is that a low cost ETF model portfolio doesn't mean that you're giving up opportunities to benefit from alpha uh, on the next slide please Sharon and, and uh, you're not getting some sort of value. So firstly, and, I, and I, so the key feature one was low cost model portfolio. Again, the key feature two here, as David has mentioned, is dynamic asset allocation. So this is the active management on our part to uh, either generate additional alpha at the asset class level or to manage downside risk. So asset classes, as David has mentioned, you know, can deviate from their fair values. The question is, what do you do about it? If you do nothing, you believe in SAA only, you, you tie yourself to the mask like Ulysses, um, but we believe we can add some value or manage risk. So we do that in a judicious way, we take moderate tilts, and as David mentioned, we focus on those four key decisions uh, as per that summary table, and that summary table forms the centrepiece of our reporting and all of the accompanying videos on that. And then on the next page here is key feature three, as David has mentioned, uh, it is the best of breed ETF selection. We undertake a very um, a diligent process of screening and research process to select the ETFs. They need to match the objectives of the asset classes that we have optimised in the portfolio. And we're selecting from ETFs from, from the entire universe available on the ASX. Presently, it's a mix of beta shares and Vanguard. Um, you may not know the codes there, but uh, anything starting with a V there is a Vanguard ETF, VBND for fixed income, VAP for property, property, VTS and VEU for international equities. As an SMA, your clients see those underlying mix of ETF, ETFs and managers through an SMA. On the next page is key feature four. Um, so this is where we are using passive exposures. 
um, passive exposures, particularly in terms of traditional or standard indices, produce good results. Um, this is a, many of you do know this, this is the SPIVA report that's produced by S&P, uh, Dow Jones Indices, and they, they essentially tabulate all of the managers in the Australian market for different asset classes and compare them to broad benchmark indices. And interestingly, over longer periods, say you look at 10 years, um, th what this shows is that 80% of Aussie equity managers fail to beat their designated index, passive index. For small caps, it's less, 45%, 90% of international equity active managers fail to beat the, the designated uh, passive index. So again, and, and, the, and it goes on for fixed income. So again, using a passive approach, a traditional index exposure for the asset class has benefits to the portfolio. Now, we're not saying or claiming that active managers, you shouldn't use active managers. In fact, we at BetaShares do partner with some, with some high quality active managers, but it does take time and effort to select the right ones and they are few and far between. The other aspect in terms of using passive investing, as Dave mentioned, is the utilisation of smart beta. This is where it really is the evolution of indexing that looks to overcome some of the limitations and pitfalls of traditional uh, market cap or, or issuer weighted bond indices. Uh, we use an equal weight ETF for our US equities exposure or part of it, QUS, and that certainly has diversification benefits, particularly from those mega cap tech stocks. We also have a part allocation to Aussie equities to what's called fundamental indexing. Uh, this was the index that Towers Watson first termed the coin smart beta back in 2005 to describe a different way to calculate a broad market exposure. Uh, it, it actually sizes companies on their economic footprint rather than accounting metrics uh, of uh, accounting metrics and, and rather than, um, sorry, rather than a popularity vote of the share price. So it doesn't use the share price to size companies and that's how it generates our performance by not overselling or overbuying and relying on mean reversion. Again, we could do a whole webinar on, on smart beta and we have on equity smart beta and fixed income smart beta, but we the key point is we utilise these exposures in our model portfolios. And over the page, uh, smart beta or better index methodologies is even more pronounced in the fixed income space. And the reason why is traditional fixed income indices are liability weighted, whichever entity issues the most debt receives the bigger, the most allocation. So for the, say for example, like the Osborne Composite, which is traditionally known as the fixed income index, well, that's changed dramatically over the past few years, with the particularly with the government bond issuance. It's created duration creep, it's created segment creep. The question is, is that what I need for my client portfolios? So certainly at BetaShares over the page, we have been pioneers in the space of, of innovations in, in fixed income indices. Uh, we have disaggregated fixed income to its sub-allocations. These sub-allocations of floating rate note, hybrids, government bonds, corporate bonds, all produce very different outcomes in different market environments. And we've also implemented better index methodologies. Um, we target a specific duration range. We, we, we target a specific liquidity profile, a credit quality profile, and we harvest roll yield. So in essence, it's better building blocks for portfolio construction. Um, our fixed income ETFs are, are used by institutional investors, advisors, other model managers. So it's logical for them to be in our own model portfolios too. So again, they're a value add there. So they're the, they're the four technical features of our SMAs. Uh, on the next slide, performance returns have been good. Um, we've been running these model portfolios for five years now and have a five year live track record. Uh, the one year performance result is very strong and, and also our longer term three and five year numbers of 8.7% per annum and 8.3% per annum for five years is favourable, particularly when you compare it to the average of the multi-sector manager universe for this growth profile, which has been sourced by the Morningstar Performance Database. And then just over the page uh, and the next one, uh, key feature five is advisor services support. Again, this came out very clearly from investment trends and the requirements for advisors, particularly for, for a model portfolio. And certainly we have put in place a number of things to assist both you as advisors 
and your clients. And it, form, and it certainly can form part of the proposition for the ongoing service to your clients. And it spans across SOA templates, fact sheets, quarterly reports, videos, webinars. Um, over the next page, we've got a sort of a snapshot here. It's available on our website and certainly let us know and we can send you the latest quarterly package of information. Um, importantly, the centrepiece of the reporting, as David highlighted, is that asset allocation summary table of our views, those three or four key decisions uh, for our asset allocation. Um, great feedback from the videos too on the next page. So these videos are very short videos. You can see a uh, very smart looking David Bassanese there. It's a three minute video that summarises um, what's happening in the markets, but importantly, our asset allocation views. And it's packaged up in a very client friendly, digestible way that you can forward, forward to your clients. Uh, in terms of the best interest duty requirements as highlighted by investment trends, uh, we have obtained, there's very few research houses now that, that rate uh, model managers and SQM research is one of them and we have a favourable four star or superior rating from SQM. And again, please let us know, we're happy to send you a copy of that report. Platform availability is quite broad. You can see the major platforms and the platform codes for our SMA model portfolios. There are three other major platforms that we are in the due diligence and even agreement stage, and certainly we'll make, make you aware of those three other platforms when they go live. It should be this quarter or the next quarter. So again, in summary, the key features, as we've mentioned, uh, dynamic asset allocation to add value, best of breed ETF selection, the mix of market cap and smart beta methodologies, which, which we have a demonstrable value add, uh, cost effective in terms of the, the overall fee load and our reporting service and support. Uh, lastly, I should highlight all, all the uh, in investment outcomes that we've highlighted here do, do come, with, come with risk, including the beta shares ETF model portfolio. As a reminder that today's webinar is general information in nature only and did not take into account your individual personal circumstances. Let's now please go to questions and look, there are, oh, look, there's, there's dozens and dozens of questions that have come through. Uh, let me, and as, we, as David was talking, I've grouped a few of them together and let me address the ones that are most common and certainly we'll come back and cover all of those with you individually. So a question here is, uh, why use an SMA over a diversified fund? Um, well, what I can share there, and again, it goes back to what the usage of, of SMAs in the first place and their um, administrative burden is a lot less, but utilising an SMA should be no more onerous or cumbersome than selecting a managed fund option on a platform. There's no additional admin burden required. If anything, it provides, as we highlighted earlier, additional transparency. Your clients can actually see the underlying holdings and they have a look and feel of a portfolio. Uh, another question here, are your models screened for ESG? Uh, no is the answer. These are meant to be a conventional standard model portfolios. What we do have though separately is a suite of diversified ETFs uh, that may span across a balanced profile, growth and a high growth profile and they make use of our market leading asset class ETFs, FE, FAIR and GBND. So they're an all-in-one portfolio at the, at the risk profile level uh, that are diversified. In fact, the fee, on, the fee load on those at 39 basis points is lower than if you were to construct it from the underlying asset classes. However, we are separate to those diversified ESG ETFs, we are exploring um, ESG SMAs and we'll have some news for you very shortly on that. Um, Dave, a question for you. Um, how do you allocate between fixed income? Are you positioned for a possible interest rate rises? Uh, look, at the moment, uh, we, we, we basically have a strategic weight to fix. So in our, again, as Vinny mentioned before, we, we, we can split up our fixed income exposures through the different ETFs that we offer. So we can go overweight duration, overweight credit or underweight credit. Um, uh, uh, so we have a few a few more levers to pull in the fixed income defensive area than the typical um, ETF-based model portfolio, which might only just give you, you know, the global 
the, the Osbond index. But so within that at the moment, we, we still have our exposure to at a strategic weight to fixed in, uh, to, to duration. So we're not underweight duration. Uh, and the reason is that we see bond yields at the moment in a range. We don't see a trend higher in bond yields and all our modelling suggests that um, to get a, a, a bigger increase in bond yields, you need to get closer to central banks actually raising short-term interest rates. Uh, we're not there yet. The RBA only this week said they're not going to, they still don't see a rate rise till 2024. Um, Fed probably unlikely next year, probably still not till 2023. So the yield pickup you're getting from fixed rate bonds, uh, we think st is still offering good return relative to cash. Uh, Thank you, sorry, and the last point is the is the credit exposure through our our cred ETF. Uh, in, a, in an improving economy, um, you know, credit spreads we don't see blowing out, uh, and so we're getting even extra yield through um, the long duration uh, credit uh, exposure that cred offers. Thank you, David. That's great. Look, I'm conscious of time. There's a lot of questions around APL, so if we are on numerous dealer group APLs. If we're not on yours, please reach out to us. Importantly, please reach out to your research manager and we're happy to assist there. Uh, can we white label these SMA models? The answer is yes. We will have to talk to you in conjunction with your platform. There will be some minimum uh, requirements for that in terms of thumb level. So please reach out to us for that. And we are running some white label SMA models um, where, where it is a white label of our, our models. Um, do I need to be listed products accredited? Again, our obs please check with your compliance manager. Our observation is, is that advisors do not because you are investing in a product on a, on a platform, not a listed security. And lastly, yeah, can I, get these, can I get these models outside an SMA? The answer is yes. We can give you this model portfolio report that we produce on a quarterly basis. Um, you'll have to self-implement that. Um, so when, whenever we make changes on a quarterly basis to the asset allocation, you'll have to make those changes or any of the underlying ETFs. And there are advisors that are doing that. Um, please be conscious though, then there may the performance returns may lag from when you actually implement to when we actually implement, but it certainly is possible. And in fact, this our model portfolio report could just serve as a sounding board for your own model portfolio construction. We'll follow up with all the other questions. We did promise we'll stop at the 45 minute mark and we've already gone over. Again, a big thank you to everyone for joining us. Please take your time to, to fill out the, the very short survey questions there. Please do indicate on that survey if you'd like us to contact us. And in any event, your BetaShares account manager will follow up with you to, to receive feedback and how we can assist further. Thank you all for joining us today's webinar. Bye. Thank you.